And I am so excited tonight to be talking to you. Usually we come on, I have a couple of guests that come on every week. And sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. Sometimes we have something that I desperately need to get off my chest. Sometimes I have a guest who wants to get something off their chest. Um, but today, I think all three of us agree that this is a subject that we really, really need to address and talk about. Uh, most of you who follow me know how passionate I am about your dog's skin. And so, of course, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about your dog's ears. But tonight, I want, I want you to know how important your dog's skin is. So before I introduce our guests, the reason we're going to be talking about it is because your, the, your dog's skin, your cat's skin, is the first line of defense. And a lot of people don't realize this, but in the very first layer of your dog's skin is their first immune cells, and they're called Langhorn cells. And those cells are there to, they're the first thing that can provide any kind of um, deterrent to bacteria and things that are coming. So if they are not protected, then your first line of defense isn't, and everything from there starts to shut down. So tonight we're going to be talking about foods that feed those foods that can deprive your dog's skin. And so, of course, I had to bring on some experts. So I'm super excited to introduce you guys tonight. If you don't already know, I have Ruby from Real, Real, from Real Dog Box. Ruby, hi. How are you? Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I got to have um, these experts who are diving deep into this. And then Ruby brought on her team someone very special that we're excited to talk to tonight. So this is Kay Stewart. Kay, mm -hmm. hi, how are you? Doing great. Thank you. Yeah, this is going to be, we, you know, we kind of talked a little ahead of time about how important the skin is. And so when mm -hmm. I mentioned to Ruby that I wanted to talk about the skin, she was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about some, some stuff. So, uh, most people, I think, know know you, Ruby, as the owner of Real Dog Box. Uh, Real Dog Box provides some amazing foods for your pets so that, that you guys can get a hold of. But they also um, put together classes that you guys can take, which I just had the pleasure of taking. I just took it last week. Um, and I wanted to do that for my clients before it, my clients know I don't refer unless I'm 100%. And so I took the class with Ruby and Kay. And I got to tell you guys it's, it's mind blowing how much information you're going to get out of it. And so it was just my pleasure. So I wanted to make sure I brought on these guys because I know they're experts in the field. And then I just got the opportunity to meet Kay. Kay, you are a veterinarian technician, correct? Yep. Veterinary technician for the last 40 years. I graduated from Purdue University. That's amazing. It's yeah. it's so hard. I most people know I was a vet tech also, and the crossover to crossover did was it hard for you to because you definitely have to cross over if you were a vet. Oh, yeah. tech. <laughs> I uh, I worked in um, lab animal research for most of my career until the last five years, and then I I joined Ruby about a year and a half ago. It was a total game changer, total paradigm shift, um, blew me away because I think to myself, why did I ever feed my dog kibble? <laughs> why didn't I think of this myself? Um, so I was a little sh ashamed. I had to get past the shaming and I had to uh, just dive into it. And I learn so much every single day and I love to share what I learn. I'm a researcher, teacher, writer at heart. So this is an absolute perfect uh, arena for me. And I'm just so passionate about these species appropriate diets. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, um, did you used to like, you were an advocate for, for a lot of the prescription diets. Yeah. I, um, I only worked in clinics for a couple of years, but with being in lab animal, yeah, everything was a kibble type, you yeah. know, it was some kind of hard food formulated for the animals, um, that had, that wasn't species appropriate, obviously. Um, and that is really concerning because how do we know that the research is even valid if we're not giving right. the right food to the animals? So, it's, uh, but yeah, so I always assumed that kibble was the right way. That's how I was taught. And um, I took a Hills three part, you know, nutrition class because I taught the pre vets, the students that wanted to go on to veterinary school. Um, I had to uh, proctor classes for them in animal nutrition. So I took the classes with them. Uh, and everything was all based on kibble and feedlot, you know, animal nutrition. And so, yeah, I just, I bought into it. Didn't yeah. think anything of it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I bought into it too. Did you have a, did you have an aha moment? Did you have a sick dog? Did you have? No, and my, not until I took this job. Um, I haven't had a dog for the last five years. And I think of the things that he, 
I put him down for dementia. Um, he was, he went downhill very quickly. And I think of now of all the things I could have done to help him. And it's, it's so sad, but you know, I just keep telling myself, you only know what you know when you know it and <laughs> you, yeah. you go from there, you know, and I don't have my own dog yet. Um, I'm in a huge transition in my life. Um, but I am living, uh, at a home that has a golden doodle. So I'm practicing all of my learned techniques and I'm loving it and she's loving it. And <laughs> well, we are so. as a community, we are unbelievably fortunate to have you because so many times we hear, oh, well, you don't, you know, you don't know anything or you don't have, you're not a veterinarian. And then we pull in the veterinarians and, oh, well, she's a crazy veterinarian. <laughs> it just, it never ends. Right. Yeah, I um, know. So so we're just so glad to have you in, in this you. community. It's, it's important that we pull people, I hate to say it, but pull people from the other side. And right. I tell that to people a lot of times, like I've been on both sides, guys. I, I was inundated. I went to all the Hills science classes yep. and all the yep. stuff. I was inundated. <laughs> I've been on both sides. So um, Ruby, I know a little bit about how you got into this. It's usually is the aha moments, but just real mm -hmm. quick before we get into too many questions and stuff, can you just share that a little bit with us? Sure. Well, I have the sad story of my dog getting sick and having cancer and going through that. Oh my gosh, he only has six months to live. What do I do now? And you just go down that rabbit hole, find all the information. And I learned about raw feeding probably within 48 to 72 hours. I came across Kimberly Gauthier's blog, um, Keep the Tail Wagging. Yeah. And I was like, you know, why are we feeding carbs <laughs> if dogs don't need them? I mean, that was literally the aha moment. It was like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. And then you start searching about raw diets and species appropriate diets for dogs and all of these wonderful transformational stories. And you're like, I got to try this. And I did. And within 48 hours, I had that same story. It was like, I went, we saw this old grumpy, really <laughs> You know, this dog that just had no reason to continue on. He had DCM. He had hip dysplasia. He was just miserable. And we changed his food overnight against everyone's <laughs> advice, right? Yes, even yes. even the uh, fresh food proponents are like, for senior dogs, you don't want to switch them right away. There's going to be a transition period. But when your vet tells you that your dog has six months to live, like, there's no, there's no waiting. Right. You just right. do it. Right. Uh, so we did it. And, you know, lo and behold, 48 hours later, there's this 12 year old Doberman running after me because I've got a chicken leg in my hand. <laughs> He's all fine. <laughs> yeah. And, and or all of us are crying because we haven't seen him run in months. Like he hadn't even gotten up for for anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. wow. So changed his life, changed my life because I just realized how powerful food is. I mean, it's medicine. It's the yeah. first form of medicine and how underused it is, particularly with our dogs. Um, so, you know, quit my job, drove 3,000 miles from Washington, D.C. to San Diego. And I was like, I'm going to start a raw dog food company. <laughs> 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 and I get here and nobody knows what I'm talking about. They're yeah. like, raw dog, what? <laughs> and I think... You know, with here in our circle just today, it's so comfortable to be talking to you guys because you get it, but not everyone got it at that time. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we wanted to create something that was a little bit easier to accept, a little bit easier to transition to fresh food. So we took the ingredients of our raw uh, recipes and we started drying them into what we refer to as treats, as chew treats and chews and whole food supplements. But really, it's just food. Yeah, right? it's, yeah. it's food that is convenient and accessible and affordable and, and part of our dog's diet. Yeah, it's a it's a, a true passion when someone quits their job <laughs> and you know, decides, well, I'm going to do this. And you're right. It, and it still sadly is. Now, I've been around a lot, lot, lot longer. Um, and back when I was doing it, there was no way to, no one was writing blogs on raw diets and all of this kind of stuff. So it was really hard, but surprisingly it still is it, you still have people going, what's a raw diet. And, and mm -hmm. so but we're, we're getting there. I think we're getting there. I think people, I just wait, I can't wait for the day. And I hope it happens before I die that Hills finally has to come out and say, all right, <laughs> here's our version of the raw diet. Cause it's mm -hmm. going to happen. 
happen. They're going to have to concede and do it. So it's just, it'll start with the fresh pet, right? Stuff. It'll start with that, that, that well, I call it subscription diets, which we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, but it'll start with that, but you watch. They'll, they'll, they'll have to concede at some point. I might be dead by then, but one day, <laughs> one day Hills is going to concede and go, oh my gosh, it does work. And these dogs are healthier. And, and mm -hmm. I hope I see that. So, um, so let's, oh, great, Lily. I'm glad. Um, some small batch uh, is another company that I, that I really like. Um, uh, so let's dive into this. We're going to talk about skin. As always, for you that are listening, you guys can ask questions as much as you want. Help each other out. I know some people might be on here for the first time. Some people might have been on here many times. So if you think you have the answer and we don't have time to get to it, please help us out a little bit. Chat in there and let us know. Um, if you have questions yourself, we try to get to all of them, but we also do really want to talk about the skin. So, so we might be on that for a little bit. So um, I mentioned right before we started, Started about how important the skin is and it's our first line of defense and about the skin cells that that are you know in that first layer most people don't know this but your skin's dog your dog's skin's layer is actually thinner than ours so they we all have three layers but your dog's skin is very very thin so it's really important that we protect it so I think I you know I'm just going to throw these questions out and you guys can both answer or you can give it to whoever you want to give it to but if you were to pick a couple of nutrients that you think are the most important for a dog or cat's skin, what would you think those would be? Well, I have, um, and I have six that I think are really, really important. Awesome. But before I go into those, um, I do want to remind people that the skin is actually their dog's largest organ. They don't yep. think of it as an organ. Um, and as any organ in your body, you have to give the right nutrients in order to support it. So the skin is an organ and high quality proteins. Um, and those are from like grass fed animals, um, pasture, red, pasture raised eggs, things that are really high quality proteins is the first nutrient that they need to have. But then um, the omega-3s, the, the uh, essential fatty acid, Omega-3 needs to be part of their diet. A vitamin A, vitamin E, zinc, and copper. Those are the six that I think are the most important for the skin. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit. Omegas are, are really important for us to talk about because I think mm -hmm. what happens, at least from my experience, is, you know, oh, my dog has a skin problem. I'm going to go get some salmon oil and I'm going to, I'm going to get it in this plastic bottle and I'm going to squirt it on top of my dog's food and hope everything works out. Um, what do you guys think about that? I know when we talk about meats, the importance of omegas, omega-6s, omega-3s, I'm going to leave it to you guys to go ahead and explain why it's so important, where you're sourcing your meat from. Um, and, and let's talk about omegas for a little bit. What do you I want to talk about this real quick because I just answered a question from someone who attended the workshop with you on Saturday about uh, feeding fish. And she had so many questions about fish, so many very great questions, which one of them was, you know, I have some leftover fish oil and I don't really have that much access to fresh fish. I want to feed that fish oil or canned fish. You know, should I just toss it? What do I do with it? And I was like, if you have the fish oil, here's what we know about it. Anything, any fresh food is going to oxidize quickly once it's exposed to air, right? And that's really what the biggest concern is with fish oil, especially the plastic bottles. But it is convenient, and that's something that we can't argue with, and they are going to carry those extra omega-3s that are so helpful to our dog's skin. But once that fish oil oxidizes, it goes rancid, and you know it because you can smell it. If it smells mm -hmm. more plasticky than fishy, then it's, it's gone bad. Uh, but what I told her was, you know, you already have it. Use it up first before you go out to the store and run and get your fresh mackerel or sardines and all the other fish that we talked about. Because I think, you know, to, to go back to what you were saying about eventually Hills is going to do this. They're going to do it and they're going to make it as dirt cheap as they possibly can. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> just fresh mass production is not conducive to fresh food. It's Correct. just not like it can't yeah. happen Agreed. Agreed. on a, on the, on the cheap uh, budget that all of the processed food is made 
with. And so if I, I really try to make people a little bit more comfortable with this transition, which is don't break the bank, like do what you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, there are, there is always a better option, right? We all have choices and alternatives, but you have to choose what works best for you, your dog, your lifestyle, your budget. And so before, you know, anyone bashes fish oil, I want to be able to say, listen, if you already have it, that was a great move on your part because your dog probably needs it. Mm -hmm. But now you have this other information so you can make just a slightly better choice and maybe opt for fresh fish or something uh, even canned, canned and and stored in water, not oil, uh, because that's going to be so, so helpful. Yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. But go ahead, Kay, you were going to say something about the fish. No, I love that. And I think to um, avoid scaring people, you know, and, and avoid um, making them feel like they have to go out and buy the most expensive thing. And, you know, that's, that's not going to help us help them. So I, I love how you said that. Um, and going back to the ones that are, are the most helpful are the small oily fish. So the anchovies and the um, smelt, um, capelin, you know, all those smaller oil fish, oily fish. And the reason we say that is you don't want the big fish that have been hanging around the ocean for a long time, absorbing all of those toxins in the ocean, uh, because dogs are really sensitive to all those toxins. And so by putting in the, um, giving them the smaller oily fish, they don't have all that mercury and all those other toxins in their body. That's interesting. I didn't, I, it makes sense. I just hadn't thought about it that way. I mean, I feed my dogs a lot of sardines, but, Mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't thought about, yeah, I mean, if this, the, the food chain, like they would get right. eaten, like they're not, they're eating, getting eaten so fast that they don't have time to absorb all those toxins that are coming from the ocean. That makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. I love stuff like that where you're like, oh yeah, that, I don't need a study. Yeah. That, that, the, that makes sense. The term is biomagnification. I'm sure yeah. you've heard of that before, yeah. which yeah. is essentially anything that they're eating is going to be magnified. And so right. if those toxins are minimal when they're smaller and on uh, lower on the food chain, the higher up they go, it's just going to be more and more and more. And that's why really most dogs shouldn't be eating other carnivorous animals if they can avoid it. Yeah. We sent, we see a lot of um, fancy like gator treats. We've had that in our secret mm-hmm. shop, but I always have a big thing and I'm like, please do not feed other carnivores you know, if you can help it and try to stick with the ruminants, the grass grazing animals, which I think goes back to your original question, which is whether other meats that we can feed that are going to be higher in omega threes. Katie, do you want to touch on the the grass fed meats? Sure. So just thinking about um, the difference in what the animal is eating. So we're, we're talking about what we're feeding our dogs, but we're feeding our dogs animals that are needing to have good food too. So it's part of that food chain. So animals that are grass fed are also getting the nutrients from the soil. They're getting um, the bacteria from the soil. They're just getting a much more uh, thorough profile of their nutrients than the corn or grain fed animals. And if you look at the meat, I have gotten grass fed meat for the last probably 25 years because I knew somebody raising them. And we ran out and I stopped at the market, the regular, you know, grocery store and picked up some hamburger and literally threw it out. Um, It was yellowish color. It smelled wrong. Um, So they, you know, the animals that we're feeding our animals have to be fed properly. Um, They're much higher in the omegas. uh, It's a much better balance. Um, They have a lot higher omega threes and not just all omega six which a lot of the animals, if they're grain fed or corn finished, are going to have a lot of omega-6 um, in, their, in their meat. So getting those grass fed animals and is really important. And I think it's getting easier and easier to source those. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question from Lily. I just want to get to real quick. Mm-hmm. She says she feeds her dogs sardines only on the weekend. I put sardines in the bowl and he would not eat it. He has been eating them for over a year, but was not interested in them. Same in them. Same with hard boiled eggs. Any ideas? She says her other, uh, her other dogs still like sardines and eggs. Mm -hmm. Well, I know with um, 
even Ruby's dog doesn't like fresh fish. So you have to find things or ways to offer it to them that they'll accept. And um, the dog that I am living with, she doesn't like fresh fish either. So the real dog treats the fish that come in their boxes um, that I get every month. She loves those. She loves the dried fish, but she, she doesn't want anything to do with fresh fish, even the canned fish. Um, yeah. So you have to figure out what your dog likes. I just yeah. always tell people, you know, listen to your dog. Maybe his body yeah. is telling him he doesn't need whatever is you know, high in that sardine, or maybe it was a, a can that smelled different to him. There's so many different variables. Right. It's impossible for us to, to just go, it's this, that, or the other. I would say, um, you could reintroduce it later and see what happens. Cause sometimes you take mm -hmm. it away for a while and then you reintroduce it in a couple of weeks and they're like, Oh yeah, now I need some of that Omega <laughs> or whatever it is. Right. They can, you can reintroduce stuff later on and see what happens. Um, the egg, I don't know if that's the, the thing, maybe because the sardines with the egg, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's a hard one to try to figure out. Yeah, what. It could be too rich. And the other thing is every dog's different and every dog has their preferences. Right. And like you said, sometimes you take it away for a little bit and you give it to them and they're like, Oh, this is new. <laughs> and, you know, we, we feed variety because we want to give them all those different nutrients from the different foods, but also nobody wants to eat the same thing every day. You just got to switch it up. So an alternative I have recently seen, I think at Costco, um, there are anchovies in water. Anchovy is a slightly different fish. So you might try that out. Um, or some of the dried fish, like the smelt, they're a little bit smaller. Texture is something that we hear a lot about if they're not already, maybe chop them up and, you know, make them slightly smaller pieces. So they're mixed in with the rest of his food. Yeah. Those are really great tips. Um, so let's go back to some of, so we're, we're talking about the omegas and we're talking about the grass fed over, but to your point, right. Grass fed is going to be very expensive. So it's really, it's, it, and I'm a lot like you people. I have, People always think that I'm saying, oh, you have to, everybody has to eat grass fed food. It's expensive. Right. So we do the best that we can do. But um, are there like, other than like, the, just going to the grocery store, are there better options? Like is grass fed mm -hmm. chicken better than grass fed beef or is, or does it, or well, not that chickens eat grass, but you know what I mean? Like <laughs> is one... Mm -hmm. <laughs> is one going to have better omegas in it when we're talking about, um, like, let's say we can't do grass fed. What meat, I guess I'm trying to get to this question in a, in a way that makes sense. Do you know what I'm saying? Like what mm -hmm. meat would be higher in omegas if I couldn't do grass fed? Well, the ruminants are higher in the omegas in general. Um, so that would be, you know, cow, goat, um, you know, those elk, um, but getting back to sourcing with the um, grass fed, I think we people don't remember that there are other places to get the food other than the grocery store. Um, I just moved to this area. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and found the Nashville co-op for raw feeders um, where I was in northern Indiana. I was able to talk or work with um, a butcher at a local farmer's market and you talk to them and, and get those parts that nobody is going to eat and get them cheaper. Um, so there's ways you have, you have to kind of be um, clever about it and think of outside the box. And a lot of times you can still find the meat that you want at a, at a cheaper price. The, those cuts that nobody wants, you know, round steak is a lot easier to find um, cheaper because most people don't want to have to deal with cooking it until it's tender. That's a good point. I, I think what you're also asking, Carrie, is that, you know, usually poultry tends to be higher when omega, in omega-6s, which is mm -hmm. the inflammatory fatty acid. Your dog needs them. You don't want to not feed them, but that's why we try to balance those out. Um, a long time ago, when I first learned about raw feeding, I read that over 50% of the diet should be made up of raw uh, red meat, right? Your beef, your lamb. And I just thought, well, that's because, you know, if dogs were out in the wild, they would hunt a large, you know, deer or elk. And that's obviously what they would eat. But in addition to the omega threes, red meat is usually higher in zinc, which is probably another thing that we're going to talk about today. 
And I, I now knowing what I know, I'm like, that's why they said we should be feeding more red meat. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, and to balance out those omegas. Yeah. Zinc is, um, is probably one of my favorite things that I want to talk about because I, <laughs> I, it sometimes when I have an animal that is really struggling with some, some problems, um, and let's say they've done an allergy test and they can't do red meat and they're whatever reason, you know, the dog might be allergic, whatever it is, I will have them do like oysters or something mm. else that's high in zinc. And boy, do we get such a good, good response, especially when we're in the depths of what the skin looks like. I, when your dog is deficient in zinc, you it's pretty evident if it's been going on for a long time, they lose their mm -hmm. hair around their eyes, their ears get inflamed, their paws get inflamed. So um, if you suspect, I'm just going to put this out there before we talk a little bit about zinc. If you suspect your dog might have a zinc problem, um, just Google dogs and zinc deficiencies and you'll see pictures of dogs with <laughs> zinc deficiencies. Um, so, and it, it can, and in its early stages, it can cause just itching, just this right. itching. Mm -hmm. On. So let's talk about that, guys. Where do we get our zinc from? Like, where and and what do you like? What do you think is so important about it in the storage of zinc? So the zinc is, uh, like you said, it's very important for the skin. And without it, you are going to get the itchy skin up to the point where it's crusty, that crusty nose. Um, so you really want to make sure there's a constant source of it. Another problem is there are anti-nutrients or nutrients in food that cause other nutrients not to be absorbed. So phytates, which is really common in some of the dog foods, will actually bind with zinc. So even if there's zinc in kibble or in other um, types of food, it's bound up and can't be absorbed by the dog. So you have to make sure that the dog has bioavailable zinc, zinc that the body can actually use and like you said, oysters is a great source, raw meaty bones. Um, and there's, there's other um, grass fed animals again, are a really good source of the zinc. Yeah. So I'm so glad we're going to, because we are going to talk about anti-nutrients because <laughs> it is probably one of my biggest pet peeves is putting ingredients in it we can go back to kind of talking about kibble, right? So we, sometimes people can look at kibble and they're going to go, oh, well, this has zinc in it. So I, I'm good to go. It's got zinc. It's got this, it's got all of this stuff on it. Um, but let's talk about what, you know, these anti-nutrients that are in all kibble, right? Mm -hmm. We know most people would agree that sugar is going to deplete your body and cause inflammation and rob yourself. But we're, we're particularly talking about binders, right? Mm -hmm. Like rice, rice is a binder and it can bind mm -hmm. to zinc and it can pull the zinc out. So tell us a little, a little bit about that and why, I mean, gosh, I mean, can you imagine I'm taking zinc all day long trying to get healthy and then I'm eating piles of rice? Um, why does well, that rice, happen? rice and beans, um, legumes, that's a huge mm -hmm. one. And all these, you know, grain feed free diets that are out there that have legumes in them, the peas yeah. and, and other uh, legumes, they all can bind up with some of these minerals. Um, and the minerals need the vitamins and minerals need to work synergistically. So if you don't have the right combinations, you can put all the supplemental zinc in the bag and it's not going to do anything for the dog. So that's why it's so important to give them whole food supplements rather than even like a zinc, you know, a powder or a zinc pill or, you know, something like that, because it's what the body can actually use. Right. And it's not being, and you're not giving other nutrients that are going to bind against it or bind it up. Do you think there is a risk of, of overdo? Like, I don't want people to like, I love your point to using the whole food supplements, but right. what is the risk of overdoing zinc? Do you think before she gets, are, go ahead. Before she gets to that, something that you said made me think about allergies and, you know, if you're supplementing zinc because you think they have a deficiency right? Because they've got itchy skin or whatever, they're inflamed. And it could just be that they've got an intolerance to a specific protein or even, you know, an allergy, we might talk about that in a little bit. 
But if we don't remove that allergen, whatever it is that's causing it, and I think that also speaks to anti-nutrients. So if it's like those grains that's causing the inflammation, we can supplement with, you know, a pound of oysters (laughs) every day. And we're not really going to see a difference in that. Excuse me. Yeah, that's probably the biggest problem with um, nutrition and skin. And I just was helping somebody on saving pets and I, he posted a picture of his dog and wants to know what, and everybody has their opinion, right? It's mange, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing. And it could be all three of them, right? right? Sure. It can be allergies. It can be a zinc deficiency. It can be all of them. And you have to dress all of them because if mm-hmm. the body is stressed, it can't heal itself. So you can't just throw one thing at it, which is what is so great about nutrition and why I brought you two on is because that whole balance, that whole of the body, the holistic part of it is what is so, so, so important. And, and that, that such a good point. I don't want our listeners to think, okay, cool. Now I'm going to get omegas and zinc. Yes. We're like, right. fix all of these problems. These are right. just things for you guys to be looking at and understanding the importance and where we get it and, and why it's important not to be feeding the anti-nutrients with the nutrients. So exactly. well, I think one and of it, the, one of the things that we talk about throughout the course that you mentioned earlier in, in the program is working with your veterinarian is really, really essential um, because you do need to get some of these tests. You do need to get some blood work and and see if there is an underlying cause along with adjusting the diet. You can't do just piecemeal and say, okay, I'm just going to add this and see what happens because it, nothing may happen. And then you think, okay, that's not it. You know, you, you need to do it systematically and in a holistic way, not just throwing things at the dog. Right. You know, well, sometimes I've seen those- to know it so you can, sometimes the vets don't know. Right. And so, right. I, you'd be surprised at how many times I've found a dog with mange and a vet never even ran. So that's why I like to educate people because you can go into your vet and say, you know what, can we run some tests on my dog, right. some nutritional panels and those kind of things. So you might have to find the right vet, um, but definitely you can, you can, you can do that. I'm sorry, Ruby, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I was going to mention one of the hair analysis tests mm-hmm. that yeah. you can measure um, minerals through their yeah. hair. And as Kay said, say you go before you even start transitioning your diet and you get some baseline levels of like, this is where my dog is. You can track those changes with the diet every four to six months if you wanted to. But there is such a thing as, you know, vitamin and mineral toxicity. You could certainly be overdoing it. You know, Mm -hmm. one of my big things is supplementing with purpose because we've got all these beautiful raw bowls on, on the Instagram and everyone's like, what's that? And they're like, oh, I add this for my zinc and I add this for my vitamin E, but nobody's wondering why we're adding it in the yeah. first place. Yeah. Right. Um, and that that can do more harm than good. I mean, I've seen I've seen some dogs improve with the addition of zinc supplements, but if they just overdo it and we see them having an upset stomach, and that's where, you know, what are the first things we're gonna see when something's wrong with our dog? usually it's an it's diarrhea right Mm -hmm. or vomiting and then we're like okay something's really wrong here and i i think at the beginning of the call i didn't think that skin issues were so often overlooked and you know you've got a a grooming facility you know a boarding (laughs) and daycare where you're seeing dogs all the time i can't imagine how many people bring their dogs in and you're like did you not did you not (laughs) notice this (laughs) there's something wrong it's sad. It's and, yeah. and a lot of times they don't. They don't they don't notice, you know, like they don't notice the tear staining. They don't notice the dry skin. Or they or they see it and they just think, oh, he's got dry skin. And and they don't, you know, to me, dry skin is is not good. You know, the right. skin cells regenerate about every 20 days in a dog. And if it's they're shedding off sooner, they're not protecting. And right. mm-hmm. so it, it it is something we have to pay. And even in our own skin, like we can't just ignore why we have dry skin or little red patches or, and we usually don't, but with our dogs, we tend to do that. And to me, I'm like, those are the first moments. That's when you have a chance to fix things. Sure. Before it's cancer and you know the beginning stages of whatever could be going on so that's why i like to talk about skin because I, I think it's so so important that we address it and pay attention to it um 
but it is frustrating. And you're right. Um, I worry too about people just giving supplements and going forward. We just saw what can happen with vitamin D. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that rat poisoning, you know what rat poisoning mm. mostly is? It's Nothing. high, high levels of vitamin D. <laughs> oh, is it? I didn't know so, that. Yeah. So some of some of the rat poisonings, they would mm. put high levels of vitamin D in it. And then it would kill. But I think they stopped for a while because they were worried about children or something. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, but I'm thinking, well, either way, if a kid gets a hold of rat poisoning. But the vitamin D can cause too much vitamin D. We watched it happen just recently with Hills. Yeah, with the Hills so, product, right. Yeah, we have to be really, really careful with overdoing our vitamins. So we're not here to tell you guys to go run out and buy supplements. <laughs> right. Any of us are telling you to do that. <laughs> um, let's... Uh, Let's shift a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, we're I told you guys we were talking about tear stains. Pay attention to those. Dry skin. Pay attention to those. But what about um, allergies? Let's talk a little bit about the difference between allergies and intolerances. Uh, what do you What do you think about that? Because a lot of times people think their dog has an allergy when in fact it may just be an intolerance. Right. So an allergy is actually an immune response. Your body has an immune reaction and it has to have at least two times that it has seen that, that protein, that antigen. Um, so like if you're allergic to bees, the first time you get stung, you're not going to have a reaction. It's the second time after the body sees it again. So that's a true allergy. That's the body overstimulated um, a response. So it is producing all these histamines and, and everything in response to an immune response. An intolerance, on the other hand, is some kind of metabolic system difference. So like lactose intolerant people, they're not allergic to lactose. Their body just doesn't metabolically break it down and absorb it properly. So it ends up causing diarrhea or some other vomiting or some other GI issue because the body doesn't know what to do with it. So that's the big difference, the, the main difference between intolerances and allergies. So, but both are important to, like, I always tell people an allergy is like, think about like a peanut allergy, right? Can't right, breathe, right. like really, like that's an allergy. Intolerance may be licking, chewing, biting, right? Those kind of things. That yeah, would be. I, I think intolerance is too, yeah, you'll see that. You'll see the skin issues. Um, and then again, like I said, GI issues too. Yeah. So um, let's talk, uh, this is, like going to probably bring some heated debate here a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Apoquil and Cytopoint. So back, <laughs> I would just say that back when I was a vet tech, um, the only thing that was available for itching and those kind of things was a drug that was on the market called Temeral P. And Temeral P was a antihistamine and a steroid that we gave. Um, but then over the last couple of years, few years, I don't know how far back, I think Apoquil right. was first on the market and then Cytopoint came on. Um, but let's learn a little bit about these. Uh, let's start with Apoquil. What, 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 what would we be giving Apoquil for? Again, that um, is for all these itchy, allergic type responses that the dogs have with their skin. And it's an injection and it, it reacts with the body in a different way. Um, then, you know, steroids just shut down the immune system. Apoquil works with the immune system. However, um, it is compromising the immune system because it's the way it's working with it. But also it only works for about 50% of the dogs um, really, really well. 30% pretty, you know, a decent amount. And then there's about 20% where it doesn't work at all. Um, but they also see that they develop a tolerance for it. So they have to get it more and more often. And over time, they, it can stop working altogether. And now you've got the same issues. And now the body's also compromised from these injections that you've given it. Um, and so I can use myself as a really good example. Instead of something like that, if you give a natural supplement, um, the quercetin that is in, I use green tea. I have horrible seasonal allergies and I'm allergic to every animal out there. Um, so as a vet tech, obviously I was taking all kinds of drugs to keep my allergies at bay. And then oh, during the, yeah, during the <laughs> seasons, it was terrible. Like every, I don't know what I would do. 
Oh yeah. I was, and that's because I worked in, um, animal research for so long. If you're working with mice and rats and Guinea pigs, it's, they're a lot more antigenic. So I was taking every single day, um, some type of antihistamine and some type of decongestant. Well, after starting at real dog and learning all this stuff, (laughs) I applied it to myself and I have been drinking green tea every day. I haven't taken an allergy pill in the last year, even during the seasonal allergies. That's amazing. And so that to me is, is saying that your body, if you give it the right support, you can get that, that allergy out of under control. So rather than giving an injection, let's give a supplement that will help the body deal with the allergy mm-hmm. instead of masking it. Cytopoint is actually, um, a type of, it's almost like a vaccine. It's, it, you're giving them a, um, or you're giving them, um, um, what word am I trying to, trying to think of, um, support for their body to actually, um, control the allergens and you're working with yeah, the immune system. Cytopoint, Cytopoint doesn't shut down the immune system. No, it doesn't. Not like, um, not like Apoquil or, Tylenol. right. Or like steroids. steroids, but it does, it does work with the immune system. And, um, it, again, it, the body can get so used to it that it doesn't work anymore. Um, yeah. and it's expensive. Mm-hmm. And None of my time, clients have had, I haven't, I, I have a lot of clients that had been doing Cytopoint. It uh-huh. works the first time, maybe the second time, then it stops working. Right. Um, mm-hmm. right. And it just, it just completely stops. So, which to me, I'm glad it's stopping because then they're stopping because I don't right. want the dog to keep having it. So I'm like, thank goodness right. that we're not keep, right. keep doing it. Like with Apoquil, I noticed that people just more and more and more and kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And then now we know that Apoquil, I think it's on the label now, right? That it's causing cancer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so the thing, what we see a lot, so we, we do our workshops, but we also have consultations that come with your wellness membership with Real Dog Box. One of the first things people are so concerned about are these allergies, these itchy skins, yeasty paws, all of that. And I can't tell you how many people have dogs that are literally hooked on Apoquel and yeah you know, you, the dog, your body, their body becomes so reliant on it because you're basically turning off your immune response, right? Mm -hmm. You're, it provides temporary relief because they no longer feel that itch, which is great for a lot of dogs who are just, you know, it's just gone too far and Mm -hmm. you need that temporary relief. But then it really just turns into a band-aid and we're not able to even see what the underlying issue is. And so if it was because the food is causing inflammation, we don't know that because we've now eliminated our ability to see whether or not our dog is bothered. We skip that one Apoquel dose, right? We miss a day or just two days or we think, Hey, he's fine. I can just take them off. And then it like comes back full force. Right. (laughs) More itchy than before. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a drug where you have to slowly wean them off of it. Um, and while you're doing that, you, you really should be identifying, well, what is causing this itch in the first place? And if you never eliminate that, you're never going to eliminate the problem. Right. What do you guys think about the, cause this is, this is new. Um, the first time I heard it was a client brought in, um, this hydrolyzed, Hills science diet food and told me that her dog was allergic to all protein. Um, what do you guys think about that? I have my opinions on it. I'm sure people could guess, but <laughs> just, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. Honestly, guys, I've never asked them that. I, these are not set up. Like I know exactly what their answers are. And if they don't agree yeah. with me, that's fine. But I'm curious, what, what do you think the chances are that an animal would just be allergic to all proteins? I don't, I don't believe it. <laughs> I mean, how so I would that my, animal live? I have my theory. Do you think that it could be like we talk a lot about getting grass fed and hormone, um, hormone free type? Do you think it could be more along the lines of the type of meat they're eating, not not the not the protein, not the beef, not right, that it's right, beef, but right. where the that source. beef is from? Right, the source, the source of it. I think that's a big possibility, but I also think it's most likely something else in that food. So if they're giving a kibble that has chicken 
and they're saying, oh, it's the chicken you're allergic to. It's probably not the chicken that they're allergic to. It's all the other fillers and, you know, anything else that's in there. Yeah. But they're identifying it as the chicken. I think that's part of it. I think it's in how it's processed. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, any extruded food is going to require a starch to bind it together and push it through those metal plates and then be heated to, you know, an incredibly high temperature. I think that is primarily what the issue is. And along that process, because it's a highly processed food, the body just doesn't know how to process food Mm -hmm. generally. And so we see all of these things happen, you know, inflammation presents itself in so many ways through the skin, uh, through an upset tummy and diarrhea. And in all of those foods for sensitive stomachs, there's always some sort of herb or fiber that is a very high amount because that fiber is going to soak up all that extra liquid in the stomach that the body has created because it doesn't know how to process it. And there won't be diarrhea anymore. So we think we fixed the problem. But with a hydrolyzed protein that's already broken down right. for our dogs, they still don't know how to process food generally. Yeah. And they'll be on that forever because their body forgets how to process the food unless you figure out what was causing it. Like you said, um, Carrie, with the other, with the skin issues and things, until you figure out that root cause, yeah. you know, we can't fix it. It's hard to, it's, it is really hard to find the root cause because I, I think sometimes people think there's just one. I'm, I'm a big, sometimes it's five or six different, you can have mange and you can have allergies. You can have, you know, but to me, it's the body's just breaking down. It's just breaking down and that's why you got mange and that's why you have allergies and that's why. So it's really getting to the root, root cause. Like most people would say mange is the cause. And I would say, no, you're, dog's immune system is the cause of the mange. Right. Because if he was able to, because I did a um, talk with some wolf experts and they were talking about Lyme disease and how all of these wolves would have hundreds and hundreds of ticks connected to them, but none of them had, they've never had a wolf with Lyme disease. Wow. Why? That's interesting. Right? Isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, hundreds, they get them, they, they, they go out and they, you know, they bring them in for research and they'll right. pick hundreds of ticks off their ears, but never Lyme disease. Wow. So I was like, wow, that's, that's what a raw diet can do, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. raw, unprocessed, it, it provides all the nutrients it needs. Um, so we promised to talk about six nutrients for the skin. So let's <laughs> talk about copper for a little bit. This one I'm really interested in because I haven't done too much studying on copper. So tell us a little bit about copper in this dog's skin. So with copper, um, the, the first thing, well, you're going to see like the fur density might get a little... Um, less, uh, you know, it's not going to be as nice of a coat, but a lot of people will see the face getting white, the, the depigmentation, um, of the hair. And that could be one of the first aspects of suspecting a copper deficiency. That's um, but the rough coat, I must have um, a copper deficiency. <laughs> I know. Oh no, I have copper deficiency. Look at there. <laughs> I, I know. When I was reading all this, I thought the same thing because I would be fully gray if I let it be. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Look, we're so. Isn't that funny? Like instantly, we yeah. all go to it. Like, oh, yeah. is that why I have gray hair? But anyway. a lot of dogs, they'll get that white face all of a sudden, yeah. or, or even on the rest of their body, they'll start losing pigment. And so, yeah. um, if it's especially on a breed that doesn't normally have that, um, you might want to be thinking along those lines. And we were talking about, um, you were saying, what if you're giving too much zinc? Getting too much zinc can actually decrease copper absorption. So that's one of those that you don't want to give too much because then you might not be getting enough copper. Yeah. um, This is why we talk about rotating and not feeding the same thing every day and not, you know. And supplementing what for a purpose, like Ruby Harps and harps and harps on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, it's supplementing with a purpose. It's right. right. It's, good, yeah. it's a good point. Yeah. We uh, we is. put a post up the other day about different types of liver, beef liver versus pork right. liver. And for the longest time, everyone thought that pork liver was inferior to, to grass-fed beef liver. And I think it's more so that it's different. Every animal is going to have a different nutrient profile and why variety is so, so important. 
Um, organ meats, spoiler alert, everyone, probably every nutrient that we talk about today is going to be found in real meat. <laughs> I know, right? And it's funny because when we were talking about doing this, I'm like, the answer is organ meat. And the answer is organ meat. Organ and the meat. answer is organ meat. And I'm like, Raw meaty bones. Oh, right? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beef, all of that. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. But it, you know, I mean, it, it just is what it is. You can't, we can't change the, the, the fact that that's where it comes from. We know that that's what our animal, our hunting animals. And believe right. me, I've been in a wolf's den, which talk about scary. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen wolf kills and down in their den and they go for the organ meat. They rip mm -hmm. open that chest cavity and they go for the organ meat because they may not have time to eat. If something right. else comes along, they got to get the fastest nutrients they can. The rest of the stuff, if things are cool, at least that's what the wolf experts tell me, mm -hmm. is that the reason why they go to the organ meat first is because they, they are always in the lookout for somebody taking it from them. And right. so they go to the nutrients first. Um, mm -hmm. And yet that's one of the things that we're not really feeding to our animals. Do we, do, do we see organ meat in, um, I'm going to shift us a little bit. And talk a little bit about these, the whole fresh food craze, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got this whole fresh food, which I'm guilty right here, right now. I'm telling you, I'm guilty of saying feed your pets whole fresh foods. And I don't say it anymore um, because it got people on a different path than what I was. Yep. Yeah. Like they started thinking, okay, so long as I can see the rice and I can see the potatoes and I can see the carrots and I can see the peas and I can see the mm -hmm. legumes. <laughs> Somehow this makes it a complete and balanced diet. So let's talk a little bit about why those would be not the same as what we're talking about when we talk about a species appropriate diet. You know, I had not had the occasion to, or the reason to go in and look at some of these new fresh food diets that are out on the market. I, I like I said, I haven't had a dog for the last five years. And um, so I did a, I did some research on it and I, I just kept going to all these different sites and I was appalled. I'm like, this is the exact same ingredients as in kibble, but it's just fresh, if you will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so you're still feeding all these carbohydrates and you're still, okay. So it's not ultra processed, it's, but it's still somewhat processed. And it has the word fresh on there because yes, it was fresh before you put it all together and processed it. Um, I, I, it blew me away. <laughs> like how can how can people go from kibble to that and think it's not the same your your the ingredients are the same if you look yeah. at them yeah i just did a a couple of weeks back um uh i just did a whole topic and i called it it's not better than kibble because i'm tired of being told that it's it, well at least it's better than mm -hmm. kibble and i i think they're equal and i know i get it it's not as processed right but if it causes the same health issues then they're equal Right? Well, and if they're I... still adding um, supplements that are not natural in right. order to meet AFCO to guidelines. Meet AFCO guidelines, mm -hmm. exactly. So. And if it's still causing zinc deficiencies that are leading to skin and ear problems, if it's right. still causing, if it still has anti nutrients in it, it's causing a problem. Um, Deanna brings up a good point. There is actually a condition, um, you know, with especially like Bedlington Terriers, I can tell mm -hmm. you, are very, mm -hmm. very, very prone to having too much copper, copper storage. So there is some concern, which is why when we're talking about these things, we don't want you guys to just go run out and start giving right. your animals copper um, or vitamin D, which is another, another supplement that, that, you know, we can talk about a little bit, but you're right, Deanna. And for anybody who's watching this, be very careful. If your dog is prone to certain conditions, you want to feed the dog in front of you, right? That's what we always say. Like feed right. the dog in front of you and don't pay attention to really anything other than paying well, attention. And again, I stress that you really do need to work with a veterinarian that hopefully you can find one that will work with you with fresh feeding with yeah. um, species appropriate, species appropriate diets, which is what I'm trying to always say now too, um, because of these types of things. And again, you, you are your dog's advocate. Yes. So if you have a certain breed, I would look into those breeds very, very specifically. Um, if any breed you have, you know, I had a, a lab shepherd mix thinking, oh, that it won't get the diseases of the lab or the shepherd. And, you know, <laughs> Six I, years in, he got fibrosarcoma and, and died at age six. And, you know, that's a lab thing. And so, yeah. um, but know your breed 
So if you have, you know, one of these breeds that have these outliers, um, you know, look into those. But again, working with your veterinary team to me um, is still very, very crucial, even though it's hard to find one that may work with you. But with the species appropriate diet, um, there's a lot of them online that'll help you. If you get the blood work done, maybe you can consult one of those online with the blood work. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge, but we have to face it. Yeah, that's another reason. I was actually chatting with Dr. Lori Kozier about the heavy metals and uh, raw companies not really doing any heavy metal testing. Mm. Because here's what I'll say. If you can find a food, if you're not making it yourself and you're doing a pre-made, if you can find a food that's using whole foods, even if they're trying to meet Africa requirements, that is 10 times better than one that's using some sort of synthetic supplement that we have no control over how that supplement is processed and how it's made. Because there could very well be too much copper or too much right. vitamin D and all of these things. But it's it's much less likely to have a vitamin or mineral toxicity with a whole food than it is with a synthetic supplement. Right. Agreed. So really quick, um, let's just, when we look at a dog's diet, and when I say diet, I mean his whole diet, not his meal, not what he's right. eating tonight, but his full diet. And I want our listeners to know that. What would you consider a whole, uh, a species appropriate diet for an animal? For a dog. Go ahead, Ruby. I'm all, well, maybe I meant a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I don't know if I got leaves. <laughs> so there what, are a, what does a, a, a species appropriate diet look like. Well, one is the easiest way for me to put it is one, if, if the dog was left to their own devices out in the wild and they have the capability to do what they do, which is a job, many of them hunt for their own food, what would they be eating and how can we replicate that in today's world? We follow the ancestral diet, some form that uh, Steve Brown originally put out many, many years ago and sort of um, made a few tweaks to have six basic components of what should go into your dog's meals a lean muscle meat from a, a healthy raised animal, organ meats, you know, all of the organs, if you can, the secreting organs, liver, and another secreting organ like kidney or spleen or pancreas. Um, some bones, of course, because that's going to be your most bioavailable source of calcium. And with the raw meaty bones, that's bones that also have the meat around them. So when our dogs are chewing them, they're digesting it all together. Also some omega-3s. And I think fish is just the most appropriate form. Um, Kay touched a little bit on why we would include fish. It's not like you'd imagine if you're, if you don't have a husky or, you know, a lab <laughs> that's going out to fish, maybe, you know, my Anatolian's definitely not doing that. You know, they wouldn't naturally have that, but we know that they need that. They need those balance of omega-3s and the best way to give it to them is through a whole oily fish. Or if you're going to use a plant-based supplement, maybe phytoplankton. Um, fiber. Fiber is really, really important and I think missing in a lot of the pre-made mm -hmm. foods. Uh, we like to include fur as our natural source of fiber and our natural source of manganese. And you've probably seen in your setting many injured dogs, you know, just from playing and um, inappropriate activity because we they're not always out on grass and soft soft land a lot of that is due to manganese deficiency because mm -hmm. they don't have the proper joint support um what am i missing muscle organ seafood you got it so, did i say yeah. all six mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so is that you know i often talk about how we talk about rotation, right? So when you're saying that, you're not saying like he has to eat beef liver every day. He has to eat beef organ, right? We're talking about over the course of every day, we want to be adding certain things in there that have that, but it can change, right? We're going to change from beef to turkey, yep. maybe um, those kind of mm -hmm. things. 
Yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's, it's, it's yeah. trying to get away from um, the class I'm doing on Friday night. I'm excited about because that's what we're going to be talking about. How did we get from feeding our dogs on the farm to kibble? And now it is so hard to get people to understand your dog because kibble companies taught us. Hills was one of them back when I was a vet tech, they would come in and sit down and buy a pizza and tell us how important <laughs> it was that the dog ate the same thing every day. And they really, 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 really got us on believing that you couldn't switch their diet and you shouldn't mm -hmm. switch their diet. Right. And that's what we're struggling with, I think, is to, to get dogs to that point. But to, to their point, we've destroyed their guts so much, right? People give their dogs the slightest little treat and then they're vomiting and have diarrhea. And so people are scared to, to do these diets. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what, and with that in mind, what, um, what recommendations do you guys give? Now I know Ruby, you were, you, you had six months like for your dog. So it was like, do or die. I got to do this. I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like I would do the same thing if I had cancer, I got to dive in quick. I don't have time to, to mess around and see if right. it works. But in general, what would you recommend for somebody who's like, all right, you know what, I'm going to do this. What, 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 what's some good advice on starting? Well, we have a lot of transitioning tips. Um, some people do go cold turkey. And I think with puppies, I went that turkey. works a little better. Yeah. Because um, puppies adapt really quickly. Yeah. Um, but you can do, you know, 25, 75, 50, 50, and then, you know, 75, 25, and kind of ease them into from kibble to raw uh, species appropriate. Yeah. Um, it really depends on the dog. Like we've said all along, every dog yeah. is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here's where I'll stress the fiber. Mm -hmm. Fur is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's so helpful. Uh, fur and herbs. When I did that transition, I relied heavily on slippery elm bark powder, uh, but I learned from our mutual friend, Rita Hogan, that that's an endangered tree now. So I really try not to recommend that as much and instead say marshmallow root. It has a similar functionality. Any sort of tree bark is fiber. Mm -hmm. It's just that. Uh, and that's going to help ease the transition. You know, whenever you feed a new food or eat a new food, Basically, your stomach is like, huh, which <laughs> what do I do? juices do I send to the rest of my digestive system? I and mean, it just sometimes it doesn't know and sometimes it overproduces. And that's essentially what's causing an upset stomach. When you tend to see a couple of things, loose stool, sometimes vomiting because it's there's just so much going on. Sometimes we see the mucus around the poop and that's just a sign of uh, extra production of uh, to lubricate all of that food and help it pass when your dog is transitioning. I like to rely on the slippery um, the marshmallow powder, and then any sort of fur on chew that you can find that makes transitioning to a new food fun because it can be kind of weird for a lot of dogs. They're like, what is this? I'm used to burnt brown bits, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> That are crunchy yeah. or you know whatever i just watched this documentary i think it, i can't remember what it was called it was about the um cats i uh, anyway and they were taking these baby kittens that had needed to learn how to hunt they just didn't know how to do it and these are wild animals down in the jungle and they still had been transitioned onto feeding some like people were taking mm -hmm. them and trying we're going to raise them and then they were getting them from them and trying to reintroduce them into the wild. And they literally had to teach these wild cats mm -hmm. how to hunt. And so it's very similar when we take these, especially cats, I got to tell you, I don't know how much <laughs> you know with kitties, but I'm a cat person and they are some picky, picky, uh, uh, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. kind of animals. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to introduce crickets into my house. <laughs> and they're saying, yeah, for hunting. Yeah, yeah. My cats are indoor <laughs> cats. They're not allowed to go out and I want them to hunt. So and just for anybody who loves crickets, I just want you to know, I know this is bad, but they only live 90 days. <laughs> they, like, they, don't, they don't live very long, crickets don't. And they are a really good protein source. And so I don't want my cats to get bored. So I'm oh like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> The, You're problem, hardcore. The, problem, the problem is there, well, it's not going to be a mouse. I'm sure <laughs> a mouse in my house, but the, the problem is, is they're play, they're still playing with them. Mm -hmm. And my cats are 
hundred percent raw because I fostered them. So they went from, it's awesome to have my kitties because they are truly a hundred percent, never been fed any kibble wow. at all. I bottle fed them goat's milk, raw goat's milk. <laughs> so they were all bottle fed straight and they still don't know how to catch a cricket. They can catch it. They just don't know what to do with it. They're like, no, I prefer mine already ground up. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, moving. have you heard of the uh, Pottinger's study? Is that the, it, well, no, maybe not. I don't know. I know that there's um, a company coming out with crickets, but it's a kibble. No, no. Well, the Pottinger study is a, it's a multi-generational study where they basically were, were studying how, what the appropriate diet for cats was. And they had them all on a raw diet and then transitioned them into a cooked, I don't think it was a kibble, but I think it was an all cooked diet. And after the third generation, the cats stopped reproducing. And which is when an animal stops reproducing, that's nature's way of telling you this environment is Done. not yeah. good. Not good. Yeah. It's not good. Yeah. yeah. I think I just didn't know the name of it, but yeah, I think I do remember hearing about that. And it's just, it's, it's just so sad it's fascinating. that, we, that yeah. we're ruining their gut to the point where we can't feed them, where we have to talk about doing marshmallow root in order to get them back on what they're supposed to be eating. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really sad. So um, really quick, because I want to make sure, because we promised everybody, um, Kay had mentioned, was there six mineral yes. vitamins? Okay, so mm -hmm. we talked about copper, we talked about zinc, we talked about omegas, we talked protein. about uh, protein. What are we So missing? the other two are vitamin A and vitamin E. Okay, let's do it. And, um, and vitamin E mainly is that antioxidant um, to help the skin. Um, it will actually help treat all those skin disorders. And there's so many different ways to get uh, antioxidants into them. But with the vitamin E, even with your, um, again, grass fed, <laughs> the grass fed meats is a really good, your organ meats, but even like blueberries and blackberries, you know, some of the different kinds of food they can have. Um, and then with vitamin A, you're, that's when you're seeing that really scaly skin. And even around the ear margins where that gets all scaly and you're not understanding what's going on. Um, so there are some different ways to uh, get them the vitamin A, again, with the beef liver and, and those kind of things. But they can also have like some carrots and yams. But you want to be really, really careful with how much because that's, again, starchy carbs and you don't really want to give very much of that. Right. Right. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I didn't want to leave without making sure we Just got touching on those. <laughs> the rest. Of the, well, because they're they're important and we need to get them in and, and we they are available in the meat. Ruby, tell us really quick before I let you guys go. How are you sourcing your meat? Where are you getting all of the, the, the organs and the meat that you're getting? We each, all of our organs are California based. So we try to find smaller ranchers and local suppliers that we can partner with and essentially take all of the innards that they're not able to sell at their local farmer's market. Um, one of the programs that I'm working on right now, this is separate. I, sorry, I, I just have no. to mention it because I'm so excited is, uh, so I have a cousin who is in an army ranger vet. And he, when he got out, was trying to start his own farm. You know, he needed a little more structure in his life. And he did that very well. He sells at his local farmer's market. And he has all of the, like, one day he called me. And he's like, hey, what do you do with pork liver? And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> Dry it. Sell it to the farmer's market. Like, there's a, there's a market for that. Um, and he's like, yeah, but I got 300 pounds. And now he's got these, group, uh, these groups of army vets who are building their own farms and they have all these extras That's that they don't so cool. know what to do with. So we're trying to build this cooperative essentially where I can support this local far these local farmers and use all of the stuff that aren't eaten for human consumption. So wow. that's sort of like this side project that I'm working on and like, what is my ideal situation for sourcing? Um, until then I do rely on whatever is accessible to us. You know, our goal is to help people, feed real food and make it convenient and accessible. And if we go to that grass fed every single time pasture raised, a lot of the times it's going to be cost prohibitive for the masses. Um, so I can't always do that, but I do look for animals that are grass fed, uh, especially if they're ruminants and as local to California as, as we can be. So how, so I know it's, it, you would have these boxes. So explain how that works. If somebody wants to get the, the boxes, explain that. 
Well, I mention all the time that variety is key. And the whole goal behind our boxes is to give you a toolkit that you can use either to complement your dry diet, your kibble diet, or to help with that transition to fresh food. It can fill in a lot of those gaps too. We talked about the raw meaty bones, um, the organ meats and the muscle meats, those are always included. So every month we make a new combination of treats and shoes. It's six to eight different items of single ingredient protein. So if your dog does have an intolerance or just something they don't like, we restrict it from your box and send you a replacement. And then the next month you get something all brand new. And that's really to encourage people to add these different proteins and not to feed the same thing all the time. And, you know, in addition, use them in our workshops where you can say, listen, you couldn't find pork kidney this month. You can use the treat in your box to, to complement your meal. Yeah. I, I love, I, I, I okay, sorry. He's about to take tip. <laughs> He's about, this is Batman. He's about to tip my computer over. So I had to grab him. He's a, he's a big guy. He's a, he's a one I almost lost actually. He went into hypoglycemia really early on, but anyway, we saved him. Um, so those boxes are, I wish more people would kind of almost like in the commercial diets, throw the beef in with the turkey, in with the chicken, in with the, you know, so that people would just kind of randomly be, because people always ask mm -hmm. me, well, how often do you rotate the food once a month, once every six months, once every, you know, for me, it's every day. Like my dogs don't eat the same thing every day. Neither mm -hmm. do my cats ever. Um, but my dogs also, and my cats also don't have any issues with their guts that I have to be right. careful of. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's all just very, very interesting. And I'm so happy that you guys are out there and I know I've kept you past time. We always say about an hour, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think that we got some, Lily, I hope to God you are not telling us that they're putting crickets in Snickers bars. I think that's what she's saying. I'm like, are we getting crickets in Snicker bars now? <laughs> um, but I think we got all these questions pretty much answered. Um, what kind of fibers we, uh, mentioned fur is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we got everything in there answered natural immunity to ticks. That is correct. What about flea and tick products? We'd have to cover that on a different thing. No. <laughs> we could get a whole other topic. So, um, but anyway, I think we got everything and you guys are so fabulous. But before we hang off one more time, tell us about the class. If you want to make your own food, because guys, I could tell you about a lot of um, commercial foods that I support that you should feed, including the uh, Ruby's, the real dog box. But I think doing it yourself is amazing. So I want you to learn and take this class if you're going to do it yourself so that when you can go to your vets, you can be empowered and say, mm -hmm. I need a balanced species appropriate diet. I take classes. I've learned what I'm doing. So you can empower yourself. So tell us, um, how do they sign up? When are the classes? Just really quick. Give us a rundown on that. Sure. We teach a live interactive workshop once a month. And you can find it at feedreel.com forward slash workshops. And when you sign up, it's a very small group of eight people. Once you're signed up, we send you a shopping list and we give you our calculator so you can fill it, fill it out specific to your dog, how much I should be feeding, what I need to go pick up. You get all your ingredients and you hop on this call and we basically go step by step. We talk about why each ingredient is important. If you couldn't find it, what an appropriate substitute is. And we talk about transitioning um, and other challenges you might run into along the <laughs> way. And then you've got a week of prepared meals and then you're on your way to basically making that full transition to a fresh food diet. Yeah. It was really amazing. I know I said it in the beginning and I'm going to say it again. It, you know, I didn't know what to fully expect. I think it was great how at the end you talk about how, okay, this is basically, I love to the thought of every day getting out and measuring an ounce and this and that and doing right. that every day is so stressful. So I'm just going to let you guys know that when you take this class, once you do, you're going to be very confident in knowing that you only have to do that a couple of times <laughs> and then you're exactly what the bowl looks like. I don't do that with my dogs. Like I, I, I so guess everything on my dogs. Um, so anyway, I don't know if there's any last things that you guys want to kind of leave our audience with any last. I'd like to just, um, 
plug again for the the course that we have though also that goes into detail of, of why and how to feed the species appropriate diet. And we go into all aspects of it. There's seven units, um, gives you a wealth of information. You complement that with the workshop and you are set to go. Yeah, I think my staff is about to sign up for the more intense one because um, mm -hmm. I want them all to, they, a lot of my staff did the one through Dogs Naturally magazine and they got certified, but I just, they need a refresher. It's been many, many years. So mm -hmm. um, I, unlike me, my staff doesn't talk about this all day long, every day. Right. <laughs> I'm obsessed. So, um, but I could always use a refresher too, but they're going to get a refresher. So they're going right. to be taking it too. So um, any last words, Ruby? No, I am excited for the nutrition course that you are going to be teaching here very soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so hopefully we can do some more collaborations in the near future. Yeah, Great. I'll be sending my, the, I'm do, I, I like to do things actually live. So I'm fortunate enough to have a little studio right next to the spa that I call the classroom. Um, and yeah, we have people coming to that and then, you know, we'll, we'll be able to collaborate together. So I'm super excited about it. Um, all right, guys, we're going to go great. ahead and sign off. Thank you so much for coming on, talking about the skin. It's so, so, so important. Um, it is, it's the largest organ in your body, your dog's body, your cat's body. It's, it's an important organ. It's alive. It has its own microbiome. Um, and it requires these nutrients and in order to survive. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on, explaining that all and the importance of it. It, it matters. I appreciate it from both of you guys. Um, to our listeners, thank you guys so much. You're so great with all the questions and helping each other out. That's super important because it is a community that really needs help to work together to change. Um, if we keep attacking each other and fighting each other, we're not going to get there. Um, we need our vets. I say this all the time. Don't hate your vets. I know sometimes I get frustrated too. I just heard a vet tell somebody that protein causes diabetes. And so it is frustrating. It is frustrating. So, I know that you're all frustrated when you get that and they tell you you can't feed raw, um, but just try to get them over to our side with kindness. It would really help. Um, that's the only way all of the animals are going to get the help they need is if we work together. So, um, but thank you all for being here. Behind the scenes is my friend, Lori. Um, she's also, I call her my friend. She's my, is my friend, but she does all of this stuff and puts it together. She's the one that types everything. So without Lori, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> thank you, Lori, for everything. Um, and I will see you guys next week, uh, every Wednesday at four o'clock. All right. Take Thanks, care. Everybody. Yeah. Take care. Thanks for having us. Bye guys. See you soon.